And thank you, Dr. Graham, for reminding me to hit the, <laughs> the recording button. I always forget to do that for some reason. Um, again, welcome uh, to everyone here tonight. Uh, as I mentioned a little bit about the Historical Research Center, if you are interested in uh, maybe providing some materials for the Historical Research Center, uh, our email is on the, uh, on the screen there. And um, so give us, we're, all, we're interested in collecting all types of materials, especially during this pandemic. So if you have uh, journals or newspaper clippings, or you've taken photographs or even flyers that you've made up about the uh, uh, pandemic and how you've adapted during these times, we'd love to document that and, and include that in our collections. If you are interested in joining the Society for the History of Medicine and Health Professions, the link is on the screen there. And uh, I would encourage you to join. Uh, dues are inexpensive, $5 for student. You don't have to be a student at UAMS. You can be a student anywhere in Arkansas or even out of state uh, to get that rate. An individual rate is just $15. Uh, so very inexpensive. And uh, we'd love to have your support for that. These stay-at-home lectures uh, occur every first Thursday. Um, and we're uh, winding down the year. So in next month in September, we'll have a history of the state insane asylum, the state hospital, Arkansas State Hospital, as is known today. In October, we'll have a history of the UAMS library. And then we'll talk about uh, in November, smallpox ep epidemic in hot springs. And then we'll end the year uh, with Rachel um, Patton talking about uh, health related uh, historic properties around the state. So I hope you'll be able to join us uh, for that. The, the uh, link that you use to join tonight will be the same for all those future lectures. So I hope you'll, you will join us for that. And they're always seven to eight. Um, so I hope you will uh, tune in for those. Tonight, we're gonna talk about a really interesting man and someone who had a, a significant impact on the medical field in Arkansas and a significant impact on the medical school, Dr. Frank Wiesenhaller. Wiesenhaller. And um, he was dean from 1929 to, uh, or 1927 to 1939, and uh, really had, a, uh, as I mentioned, just a huge impact on the medical field in Little Rock and in Arkansas. Let's begin a little bit just talking about his um, um, his 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 uh, childhood. So he was born way up in northwest Missouri in Graham Nottoway County, Missouri, in 1864. His parents, George and Sarah Wiesenhaller, um, uh, were farmers, and um, and he had three brothers. Um, he's actually Dr. Wiesenhaller, Wiesenhaller wrote an autobiography, and I'm going to read just a little bit of the entry to that because he was such a good writer, and he really describes his childhood and his career in such uh, uh, in flowing language. It's really very interesting. So he starts out his autobiography by saying, "There can be no story of life; no one can tell it, not even the one that lives it." For each day is li lived is gone, and with it much that is lost forever. So a very interesting uh, introduction, introduction to his autobiography. He goes on and he talks about um, his parents um, and um, his family, his, how, how he enjoyed growing up on the farm, uh, and how kind of idyllic uh, uh, it was living up in northwestern Missouri. Unfortunately, um, at the age of 16, his mother died. And so that broke up the family. Uh, one of the brothers, his older brothers, had already moved away. The other two uh, were sent to live with relatives. And he was sent to northwestern normal school uh, in Missouri. And um, so he was 16 years old. He stayed there for one year. Um, and then he um, went to medical school and he ended up at the College of Physicians and Surgeons at Columbia University in New York City. And uh, so he was 17 from rural Missouri. He, en he ends up in the big city of, uh, uh, as a 17 year old. 
And he talks about in his autobiography just how what he saw and what he did in uh, when he was in medical school in New York. And I'm gonna, uh, this is right when he arrives uh, in New York. Columbia School of Medicine was in my student days at 23rd Street and 4th Avenue, the balance of the university on 49th Street and Madison Avenue. Let me see, I'm sorry. Uh, New York had no skyline such as now, where the flat iron building now stands was a two-story frame structure, a photograph gallery, the produce exchange nine stories was then the tallest building in the city. The city was lighted still with gas. There was no subway. Beecher and Talmadge preached each Sunday in Brooklyn. Occasionally I would cross the new Brooklyn Bridge and hear them walking to and back a long hard walk. My work was hard and kept me busy. I saw Edwin Booth and Hamlet, a never to be forgotten privilege. And he goes on, he talks about his studies uh, in, in medical school. But one of the interesting things in his autobiography is he talks about evacuation day, the evacuation day parade in 1883. I'll admit I had not, uh, I was not familiar with evacuation day and that is the celebration of when the British troops left uh, North America after the Revolutionary War. And so he talks about his parade that he went to for evacuation day in the fall of 1883. In the fall of 1883, I saw evacuation day parade, 100 years since the British troops marched down Broadway and sailed for England. In a carriage was President Arthur, General Grant, Robert Lincoln, and Judge Grisham. I gazed in wonder and admiration at the old 69th, 69th New York Fighting Irish and many other famous regiments. Later at the pole grounds, my first game of football, Yale versus Princeton, Beecher against Twombly, both famous backs. Henry Ward Beecher was in the audience to see his son play, as was H.K. Twombly, the great New York merchant to watch his boy. I was thrilled and have never quite lost the love for it. My first year was a grueling hard one. And at the end of it, I developed acute appendicitis. So he goes on and talks about how this appendicitis um, interrupted his studies at, at medical school in New York. But uh, luckily for us, he, he, um, he improved, his health got better, and he graduated from uh, College of Physicians and Surgeons in 1885. So what do you do after you graduate from medical school? Well, you try to find a job, right? He ended up in Custer County, Nebraska, and Custer County's in red in here, and you can see it's in the middle of the state, um, sort of in the middle of nowhere. So he ends up in Nebraska in 1885, and he stays there until 1892, uh, being the country doctor uh, to uh, this rural vast prairie in Nebraska. And here are just a few photographs that I found, um, I discovered about um, uh, Custer County, uh, Nebraska in the, in the mid 1880s when, um, when Dr. Visenhaller would have been there. So on the, on the left, you can see a family standing out with their team of horses and sod house in a sod house, um, the South made family in Broken Bow. Uh, which is near where Dr. Uh, Visenhaller was. He was in Westerville, Nebraska, um, in Custer County. And then on the right, you see another uh, sort of uh, a house built into a, 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 a hill, a mound uh, with the goat. Is that a goat? No, that's a cow on, on top of the, uh, on top of the uh, house. And I love this picture on the right with the family sitting out and they have their watermelons. Uh, sitting out on the table. So these, and these most likely were probably some of the families that Dr. Visenhaller um, attended to when he was in uh, Custer County, Nebraska in the mid 1880s and early 1890s. So it's just, a, and uh, as I mentioned, it was a vast area. He had a large area to, uh, to attend to. And he actually wrote uh, an article about his early days in Nebraska, and I'm gonna read just a little bit of that to you. My arrival in Westerville was sometime in, sometime in August, 1885. I had traveled over the Union Pacific 
from Omaha to Kearney, and then by stage line to Loop City, Lees Park, and Westerville. My arrival there followed a horse race in which the owners living in Westerville had been beaten by an unknown by celebrated horse, which went about commun doing communities like Westerville. The town itself was full of life. The contacts between Westerville and Broken Bow for the county seat had terminated a short time before in favor of Broken Bow. The anger and feeling between the two places still continued. There was no railroad at that time and the country, except for the rough land, had all been taken by homesteaders, preemptions, and timber claims. My first home was at the Eureka Hotel. This hotel was part of the Bookno Hardware Store and was the largest building in town. There was only one other physician in town, Dr. Moy Morris, who afterward married Miss Varney. My reason for coming had been the death of a very popular and beloved physician, Dr. Waterbury, who had recently died of typhoid fever. The period of waiting for practice in Westerville did not apply in my case for in a week's time, I was as busy as I could be paying calls in every part of the county. It became necessary for me to hire a horse, not possessing one, which I did from the Rambo livery station. This Bronco had a good deal of white in his eyes and bucked with me the whole of the main street of the town, much to the delight of John Burge Turpin. Luckily for me, I was not thrown. So he, this is a, a really nice uh, uh, autobiographical um, narrative of his time in Custer County, Nebraska. Really interesting to read, and um, just a, it just gives him a glimpse of what it was like for a, a a doctor in the middle of Nebraska in the 1880s. He stayed in uh, Dr. Visenhaller stayed in Nebraska until 1892. And then he left and went for a brief time to the University of Vienna in Austria. He stayed there uh, studying uh, uh, ophthalmology. Um, and he, so he stayed in Vienna for a few months before he landed at the Royal London Ophthalmic Hospital, um, where he stayed for about a year until 1893, late 1893. There he studied and uh, he did not graduate from either of those uh, universities uh, or institutions, but more he went for continuing education just so he could learn more about uh, ophthalmology, which was his chosen uh, field in the medical profession. So after he returns, he gets back from um, uh, London, he comes back to the United States and he ends up in St. Louis. Um, where he attends um, the Missouri Medical College, just for a little bit of uh, additional education. Uh, the Missouri Medical College in St. Louis eventually became the St. Louis uh, uh, University Medical School, which then uh, merged with Washington University and is now part of the Washington University. So it's in St. Louis uh, in 1893, where he meets Dr. Um, T.E. Murrell, who is in St. Louis. Murrell was a doctor in Little Rock. He was an ear, eye, ear, throat, and nose doctor uh, in the capital city. And he met Dr. Bisenhaller, and he invited him to come to move to Little Rock to set up a practice with him in Little Rock. So Dr. Bisenhaller did. T.E. Murrell already had a successful uh, business uh, in Little Rock, and together the two of them uh, put together a practice, Doctors Morell and Visenhaller, and they had an uh, their um, uh, office was in the old Masonic Temple at Fifth and Main Streets. So the building uh, had shops on the bottom floors, and then on the top floors were were uh, were used for Masonic uh, activities. So Dr. Visenhaller settles into Little Rock in the mid-1890s. Um, Little Rock was not that big at that time, probably around 15,000 people. Uh, but it's here in Little Rock that he, he meets uh, Renetta Beetleman, and he marries her um, around 1898. Um, they get married, uh, and they eventually have 
four children. So in Little Rock, they first live uh, uh, in a smaller house. And in 1905, they buy the Holtzman house at 500 East 9th Street. And it's here uh, um, at, in, on 9th Street that they would live for the remainders, remainder of their lives. And the house today is still standing. It's known as the Holtzman Bisenhaller House um, in, on 500, at 500 uh, North or East 9th Street, excuse me. So the house was originally built in 1898 by, by Holtzman. Um, and the couple and their family became very popular in Little Rock. They, they were always um, part of, uh, had a lot of, of uh, parties at their house. Here's a photo of a Christmas family dinner uh, that they had in 1935, um, many years later. But there's also a story, uh, one time, Dr. Visenhaller was a member of the XV Club, which was founded in the early 1900s in Little Rock, uh, uh, sort of a, a society club for uh, prominent men of Little Rock. And so he was one of the members of the XV Club. And there's a story where... Um, they were having a party for the XV Club um, and this house on, on East 9th Street, sort of a big to-do, uh, very formal get-together. And uh, the servants were bringing out the, the meals and everything, and they were using the back stairs uh, to, um, uh, to, to bring things out. Somehow there was a cow in the backyard or somewhere <laughs> close by, um, that came into the back door, went up the stairs, the back stairs, which is what the uh, servants were using, and the cow got stuck. And uh, so there was um, some uh, uh, disgruntlement <laughs> on Dr. Visenhaller's part that this sort of messed up the party of the XV Club uh, that they had spent so much time getting ready for. So that's just an interesting uh, story about um, Dr. Visenhaller and a, and a funny story about uh, uh, their house and, and the, the XV Club. So I, th I thought that was an interesting uh, sort of side note. So Dr. Visenhaller, when he comes to Little Rock, he is setting up an ophthalm uh, 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 ophthalmology practice with Dr. Morell, and he also gets a faculty appointment at the University of Arkansas, a medical school. So the medical school was still fairly new. It had only been established in 1879, only a few years earlier. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, so Dr. Visenhaller comes on the faculty in the late 1890s. Uh, this is the school. They were at the second uh, medical school site at this time when he came uh, to Little Rock. Uh, the medical school is at that time located at 2nd and Sherman Streets uh, in downtown Little Rock. So Dr. Visenhaller uh, taught uh, at this medical school. It was in this building that um, he interacted with the other faculty members, interacted with the students, and, um, and then in 1912, the medical school moved to the old state house and stayed there until 1935, and Dr. Bisenhaller was uh, instrumental in moving the medical school from the old state house to a, to a new medical, uh, to a new site, rather, in 1935. But it was in these two buildings where he uh, 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 taught classes and actually uh, uh, did uh, had clinics. So this is a photo from 1903. This was uh, in the Second and Sherman uh, Street building. This most likely is the Isaac Folsom Clinic, um, which was established uh, by uh, Dr. Isaac Folsom from Lone Oak County. He left a be uh, uh, he bequeaths money to the university in the early 1900s uh, to create this, establish this clinic uh, to, um, uh, for the citizens of Little Rock. So this is a photo uh, inside, most likely inside that second and Sherman Street uh, building uh, where doctors Edwin Bentley, one of the other founder, a founder of UAMS and Dr. Visenhaller examining a child patient in front of uh, medical students. Now, a lot of Dr. Visenhaller during his time at the medical school saw a lot of uh, changes uh, that uh, during his time there. In 1901, 
Uh, he saw the first female graduate of the medical school, Dr. Annie Shopik. Um, and then he also would have interacted with Dr. Ida Jo Brooks. I, Dr. Uh, Brooks actually applied for medical school in the 18, uh, I believe it was 1880s. Uh, and she was rejected because of her gender. So she went to Boston, received her medical degree from there, came back. And, and in 1912, she became the first female faculty member of the medical school. So Dr. Bisenhaller would have interacted with um, Dr., both Dr. Uh, Annie Shopik and Dr. Ida Jo Brooks during his time there. He would have also have been uh, at the medical school when the College of Physicians and Surgeons, not to be confused with the College of Physicians and Surgeons at Columbia University, where he graduated from, this College of Physicians and Surgeons was located in Little Rock, was a competing medical school against um, the U of A Medical School. But in 1911, after the Abraham Flexner report came out and blasted both the um, the quality of education at both these schools, they were merged, they merged. And so Dr. Visenhaller would have been at the medical school when the College of Physicians and Surgeons and the U of A Medical School come, uh, merged together. So during his time as a faculty member, he saw all these changes that were happening in the medical uh, school. Um, so what an interesting time he lived in uh, and to see all these changes. And it would be interesting to note, there's, he doesn't remark in his autobiography about um, uh, the, um, like Dr. Annie Shopik being the first woman uh, graduate of, U, of the medical school. So it would have been interesting had he, um, had he commented on that. So he, uh, he, he is at the medical school, World War I uh, breaks out. Um, he is at that time when, when uh, during uh, World War I, he is uh, working for the, or he is uh, acting uh, at the Red Cross as a field director. But in 1917, he is called up he, uh, into the army, he volunteers. So he goes to Camp Pike, spends a little bit of time in Camp Pike, Pike at the base hospital there. And then he is transferred overseas to France, where he becomes the, um, the, the, uh, uh, the a major in charge of field of base hospital number 109 in France. And it's there where he spends the rest of the, uh, the time uh, during World War I. Um, and he talks about his time uh, there, talks about what he saw during in World War I. And so it's a really interesting uh, uh, sort of description of World War I. And I'm trying to see if I can find uh, something. So here, here's just a few things. So um, I inspected all the hospitals twice daily, heard complaints of the staff daily, and occasionally an enlisted man. We never did get our complement of nurses there. There were simply not enough to supply us. Mrs. Ford, who had been the head nurse at Johns Hopkins, was our first Red Cross hand, head, a lovely, a lovely white-haired lady, and the soul of gentleness and efficiency. Um, talks about some of the, the, the uh, injured that he met. Um, the, wound, the wounded kept on coming by the train load from Argonne Forest fight, from the Argonne Forest fight and from the evacuation hospitals near the front. Our roll of sick and wounded rose to 1800 and we had in charge 22 hotels. So they would take over hotels as uh, hospitals for uh, the wounded and the sick. The German wounded prisoners were all in our care in the hotel Helder. They gave us no trouble. One boy of 19 had nine bayonet wounds inflicted, so he said, by a barebacked man who proved to be from Alabama. Sometimes in my rounds of inspection, I would surprise a crap game and confiscate the money, turning it over to the fund for the sick. Occasionally, when the amount was large and the pleading too strong, I would give some of it, some of it back. So just an interesting, again, just interesting uh, commentary on what he saw uh, during his time 
in um, over in France as uh, part of the uh, as lead of the uh, one of the base hospitals there. I have on your screen a photo of Dr. Morgan Smith, who was medical school dean from 1912 to 1923, and then 1924 to 1927. In 1927, Dr. Smith urges uh, Dr. Wiesenhaller to consider uh, becoming dean uh, for the medical school. He, uh, Dr. Wiesenhaller uh, sort of negotiated his, uh, his appointment as dean. He said that he did not want to have to go up every year and ask to be re-elected to the position of dean. So he negotiated. He said, if, if the board of trustees will give me a five-year uh, uh, term as dean, then he, I will accept it. And so the board of trustees agreed to do that. And uh, Dr. Wiesenhaller became dean of the medical school in 1927. Of course, as we know, he stayed much longer than five years as dean. And in, in, in fact, he would stay until 1939. And it was during his time as dean that he really made the, a big impact on uh, the medical school. The medical school had always been um, cramped uh, in their facilities, in both the uh, in all the buildings that they had been in, uh, the first three sites of the medical school. There had never really been; they never had a hospital that was attached uh, to the medical school. They always had to the for clinical practice, they had to go out into the hospitals in Little Rock. And Dr. Wiesenhaller knew that this was a problem, this was an issue, and so he really advocated uh, for many years uh, for a brand new medical school, a large, a larger medical school, and one with uh, a hospital attached. In the 1930s, the city of Little Rock built this, a new city hospital over a uh, uh, sort of where the law where the law school is now, and then in 1935, Dr. Wiesenhaller was successful in getting money from um, uh, um, it's not the, the the not the WPA uh, the PWA Public Works Administration to uh, build a new medical school. And so a half a million dollars was given to Arkansas to build a new medical school. Mainly that was because of Dr. Wiesenhaller's relationship, his friendship with Senator Joe T. Robinson. Joe T. Robinson, a powerful senator, uh, uh, he and Hattie Car Caraway were both in the Senate, both um, powerful members of the Senate. And it was from that friendship with Dr. Wiesenhaller and Joe T. Robinson that that money came to Arkansas to build a brand new medical school. The medical school was located um, on 12th, at 12th and McAlmont Streets, where the uh, law school is now. And in fact, the law school is in the, in the building of the, is in the old um, medical school building there. But uh, the, relate, the friendship between Wiesenhaller and Robinson went back a few years. They had become friends a few years earlier, in fact, when uh, Senator Robinson came back to Arkansas and Dr. Wiesenhaller was appointed as uh, head of the committee to, uh, to plan a celebra celebratory welcome um, to, for the Roman, for the senator as he came back to Arkansas. So it was from this committee appointment of Dr. Wiesenhaller where he forged a relationship, uh, a strong friendship with Senator Robinson and that eventually that paid off um, later on with Robinson helping the money, uh, uh, secure the money to build the new medical school. The new medical school, modern in every sense, um, it was connected to the city hospital. So for the first time in the medical school's history, you had the, uh, the educational part of the medical school right next door uh, and in close proximity to the clinical. So the medical students could easily do their clinical work 
and not be farmed out to the different hospitals. So that was the first time in the medical school history that that had occurred, that that was all a campus of both the hospital and the educational part of it. Another uh, situation that uh, Dr. Wiesenhaller uh, oversaw or, or sort of got the state out of this mess that the state had given them, had gotten themselves into. The legislature never really, it's sort of like facilities. The, the medical school was never given enough money uh, to operate. And of course, that still is uh, the case today where UAMS doesn't receive enough money from the legislature um, as much as it should. That was uh, true in the 1930s. And Dr. Wiesenhaller kept warning uh, the legislatures, the legislators, and the uh, uh, government officials that this was going to come back and bite the medical school because they were going to end up uh, losing their accreditation. He was ignored, and lo and behold, the American Medical Association did um, at one at their meeting uh, took away the accreditation of the medical school. Uh, now, if the, so the legislature came back, they got, gave money to the medical school and accreditation was returned uh, by the American, Med American Medical Association. But it was Vizen, Dr. Wiesenhaller's um, leadership that actually made that happen and, you know, sort of get the medical school on stable financial ground. And if it weren't for Dr. Wiesenhaller, uh, we, our medical school would never have gotten reaccredited and uh, most likely it would have closed. Uh, so the medical school owes a lot of, um, a lot to Dr. Wiesenhaller. Now, in addition to his uh, service as dean uh, uh, at the medical school, Dr. Wiesenhaller was very actively involved in the community as well. He was a member of the American Legion. He was chairman of the American Legion uh, in Little Rock. Uh, he was a founder of the Community Chest Organization in Little Rock, which um, was an organization to, um, to help the, the uh, less fortunate in Arkansas or in Little Rock. And he was also a, a very active member of um, the Masonic Temple in Little Rock. And in fact, he had become a Mason when he was in uh, Nebraska in 1888. He had become a Mason. And, uh, but uh, there's an interesting, um, let me see, there's an interesting uh, write-up about Dr. Uh, Wiesenhaller in um, some biographies of, um, uh, biographies of Freemasons. Uh, Masons in Arkansas. So it says that um, he was, um, his high moral and ethical standards and his worthy associates naturally led him to seek the enlightenment of the philosophical deg degrees of Masonry. He was first made a Mason in Gladstone Lodge, number 176 in Ansley, Nebraska in 1888. Goes on to say, um, uh, let's see, Dr. Wiesenhaller uh, and six others received the 31st and 32nd degrees on May 21st, 1897. In 1932, when Brother C. Eugene Smith resigned as deputy, Brother Wiesenhaller, who had been made Knight Commander of the Court of Honor in 1911 and coroneted Inspector General Honorary of the Supreme Council of Southern Jurisdiction, Jurisdiction or 33rd degree in October 1913. And then he was appointed deputy of the Supreme Council on January 2nd, 1932. Um, so he was a very, very active member of uh, the, the uh, Masonic Temple here in Little Rock. Uh, this would have been um, the temple that he would have uh, attended, joined, uh, belonged to. This was built in 1924, still standing, of course, uh, still used by the Masons. Um, so very, very active uh, in the Masonic Temple and the organizations in Little Rock, just a really a, a fine individual uh, 
leading the medical school and and being so active in organizations and institutions around the city. Now, an interesting thing about uh, Dr. Bisenhaller, and I didn't know exactly where to put this in uh, in the presentation, but I found this very interesting. Uh, so in addition to all of his uh, accolades uh, for his work in the communities with the Masons and the community chest and all that, in 1908, he was actually appointed Belgian Consul General uh, or, or Consul to, uh, Belgian Consul to uh, Arkansas. And that happened that he was the guest, uh, it was again the XV Club, uh, and the Council General, uh, the Belgian Council General Paul Hageman was at that dinner and uh, sort of in the conversation, someone made a comment that there were two uh, Belgians in Little Rock at the same time. And that struck up a conversation between Dr. Wiesenhaller and Dr. and Mr. Hageman. And, and Dr. And Dr. Wiesenhaller uh, noted to the Council General that his family had, had immigrated uh, from Belgium to America over 200 years ago. This was in 1908. So from that, uh, Mr. Hageman went back and made and got this appointment as Belgian consul to the state of Arkansas for Dr. Wiesenhaller. I just think that's a wonderful story and uh, just sort of shows just how uh, uh, well liked and uh, just a really all around good guy he was. It just, it, that's just a really nice story in my opinion. And I just think that's a sort of a really nice um, testament to his character and personality. So, you know, he, Dr. Wiesenhaller made such great contributions to Little Rock, the medical school. Here's a photo from 1930s uh, in front of the Isaac Folsom Clinic. Of course, that clinic moved over to the new medical school when it moved um, uh, to 12th and McAlmont Streets. Dr. Wiesenhaller, he was a very popular dean of the medical school. Uh, but in 1939, he decided, you know, I've, I've been doing this uh, for 12 years and uh, he, he, he wanted to do more. He wanted to travel. He wanted to go back to Europe, wanted to go back to France. And so in 1939, he steps down as dean of the medical school. Unfortunately, uh, he did not live long uh, after his uh, uh, retirement. 1942, he dies. Um, his wife, Renetta, had died in 1936. And Dr. Wiesenhaller, his, he was so well known in not just Arkansas, but in the U.S. in so many different circles that his obituary made uh, the New York Times. And as uh, you can see it on the screen, Dean of Arkansas University Medical School dies in Little Rock. And in fact, Dr. Wiesenhaller was so well thought of that he was known as the father of the medical school. And uh, so I think I'm going to end it there. And um, I appreciate you all being here tonight. If you have any questions, please use the chat feature. Um, you can type your question in. I'll be happy uh, to answer it to the best of my abilities. If you have any questions or if you have any comments afterwards, uh, there, my address, my email address is on the screen, so feel free to send me an email. I'd love to hear from you. And I'm going to uh, stop uh, sharing this screen, and uh, so my video will come up. But please use the chat feature if you have any questions. Um, and I will say that I was, I knew about Dr. Wiesenthaler, of course, but uh, I did not realize to the extent of his um, um, just sort of his contributions to Arkansas as a whole and Little Rock uh, as a whole and to the medical field and his um, um, his involvement in the in, in the Masonic Temple and the community chest and uh, the American Legion it was it's just really impressed me of all the things that he's done and um, I'm really glad that I was I have this opportunity to learn more about him and uh, his uh, if you're ever interested in Dr. Wiesenhaller, I would encourage you to come to the Historical Research Center and, and look over his autobiography because it's really, um, uh, really interesting. So we do have a question. Uh, 
Why did his photo appear in the Prescott, Arkansas newspaper down in Nevada County? Was it for his medical expertise or his Masonic title? I think it was his Masonic title, uh, actually. And um, you'll notice that there was a newspaper, not only from Nevada County newspaper, the Picayune, but also there's um, articles in the Hope Star as well. And so, of course, he would have been known throughout the state for being dean of the medical school. But I think mostly he was well known more, he was known more from his activities with the Masonic Temple than he was uh, throughout the state than he was the medical school, although those were uh, probably, uh, he would have been known for both of them. But I think he uh, was mentioned in the Prescott paper because of uh, his Masonic uh, ties. Uh, we have a question, did Dr. Wiesenthaler have any family who stayed in Little Rock after he died? I'm not sure. I, I, I think so, because I think I read, and Kaylee Williams, Callie Williams is on here, and she might be able to help me a little bit more, but the, the that house on at 500 East 9th Street stayed in the family, I believe, until maybe a little bit, at, at least a little bit while after his death, so I'm not sure if his, I think some of his children stayed uh, in Arkansas, but I'm not, I'm not entirely sure of that. Callie, if you're on, and you know that, um, the answer to that, I'd love for you to uh, chime in. We have any other questions? And I will say that that there is a tour, uh, the Pulaski County Historical Society and the Arkansas Historic Preservation Program did a, uh, had a tour of the Holtzman uh, Vincent Haller house a few years ago. Um, so, uh, I did not go to that tour, but uh, it sounds like a very, it was the Quapaw Quarter Association, uh, not the AHPP. Um, but uh, the house sounded very interesting. Um, so one day I'm hoping uh, they'll do another tour again of it. And I think, excuse me while I move back a little bit and see if I can find my notes. Um, I usually just throw all my stuff on the floor when I get finished with it. Um, let's see, let's see, after several decades of ownership by the Wiesenthaler family, these are notes from Callie Williams, um, uh, uh the house was renovated into several apartments and professional office space during the 1970s. So uh, from that, I gather that the family owned it until the 1970s. So I would assume that the, uh, the children were here. And his kids died, um, from what I remember in my research, his kids, um, he had, uh, I think, I believe two daughters and two sons. Um, they lived until the 1990s, maybe early uh, 2000s, um, but I, I can't remember if they were in Arkansas or not. I apologize for that. We have any other questions? Again, thank you all for being here tonight. I hope you'll tune in for next uh, month's uh, presentation on the Arkansas State Hospital. That'll be by Mike Hood, who works for the city of Little Rock. And um, this uh, is recorded, uh, even though I, I always forget to start it back up again. But we do, I do edit these and I put these online. We have a, a YouTube channel on uh, where I upload these videos. I usually try to get them up um, uh, about a week after I, uh, we, we do these presentations. So I will send out an, an email letting you know when the, when the video is up, but please feel free to contact me at my email if you have any questions or comments. I'd love to hear from you if you have any information on Dr. Wiesenthaler. So um, if we don't have any more questions, I'll let you go for the evening. Thank you again for being here and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next month. Y'all stay safe and I'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.